you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 12. I will tell you that this has been, uh, we've been in a series, uh, started in October. Uh, one of the great men of the last century, it was written on his tombstone how he lived. And this is the way they described his life. To know God, to love God, to believe God, to walk with God. And then the last one that they wrote on how he lived his life, I will tell you, it's, it's been difficult for me <clears throat> to uh, live and die for the glory of God. Um, those of y'all who've gotten to know me, you know that I'm never nervous when I preach because it's not my words, it's the words of God. So I don't have to, I don't have to say that I know these things. I just say this is what God has stated. You just preach the truth. That's never bothered me. And, but I, I will tell you, it has been decades since I have been wrought by a thought to live and die for the glory of God. It is something that is all through Scripture. Usually the only time I'm ever nervous is if I'm not prepared. But I've been studying this for the month of October. A week and a half ago, I probably spent 30 hours just diving into the Word of God. And y'all also know about me that my problem is never not having something to say, it's having too much to say. So... I decided, well, I'll, I'll do it in two weeks. No, I'll do it in three weeks. No, I'll do it in four weeks. And I said, just do it in one. And know that I cannot fully talk about this Scripture. And yet, and yet, it is something that Christ at the most crucial point wanted everyone to know. It is, I believe, the secret of the power of living with God, what it means to know Him, what it means to love Him, <clears throat> by faith to believe in Him, and every day to have it as part of our life, not just to get up and walk our day, but to walk and abide with God. It all comes to the point of living of God to live for Him and to die for Him. It's an attitude. It's an attitude that we need to carry with us. Knowing that God never asks us to do anything that harms us. Knowing that everything that He uh, invites us to do with Him is a blessing for now and for eternity. It is also, something that does not come natural. I'm not sure why this is, but why is it that the doctors are the, one, the last ones to get a physical? Why is it that lawyers are the last one to get a will? Why is it that good people, I said this Wednesday night, if I could describe the people of New Holland, I would say they're a collection of wonderful people who are seeking to walk with the Lord. Wonderful people. But why is it that good, moral, upright people are the last ones, maybe I shouldn't say last ones, but maybe are, can I say they're the ones who really are not sure that they need to do anything to change their life to live for the glory of God. I think that's why it's rocked my heart. I think that's why it has disturbed my spirit and has made it so hard for me to share this word. I think it is very easy for me if, if we saw the pictures of Code up there. Isn't he a cute kid? I think Christian and, and Kim do a, a fantastic job and they're going to come to dedicate him to the Lord. But I, I think... Every one of us, if we were out here in the parking lot and we saw a little coat moving out from behind a car, we would run to grab him and push him out of the way 
even if it meant that someone would back over us. We would not even have to think about it because it's who we are. We would willingly give up our life without thinking or question to save the life of, of someone else so precious to us. And yes, that is exactly what Christ did. And yes, we take it for granted. And yes, it was the key to his life. But it's not the key to ours, though it should be. So, take your Bibles, if you would, and stand with me. John chapter 12. You pray for me today. As I will try to faithfully Share the Word of God. John chapter 12, verse number 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Hear these hard words. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Hear Jesus' words. Father, Glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I think that's the words from God for them, but I believe it's our prayer. We know God has glorified his name. And we know that he will do it again. Even so, do it today, Lord Jesus. For your people are here who love you and want your will to be done. Let's pray. Father, Lord, give us a mind. Give us the thoughts of Christ. Give us an ability to be with you this morning. Jesus, as you spoke them to them in that day, may we hear not only with our ears, but with a repentant heart, with eyes that are wide open and a soul that's willing to honor you and bring glory under your name. Move us from where we are to where we need to be. Father, be with me and help me to share exactly your will and nothing more, nothing less. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. John 11 begins with uh, the story of Lazarus. Literally, just a few days before the Passover, it was a very crucial time. John, when he wrote his Gospels, think of all the stories he could have told. Think of <clears throat> all the important messages that he could have shared that Jesus preached. All the miracles that were done by the Lord's hands. But mostly what he did was have long passages that focused on a person or an event or a thing that occurred. But really, in most of his book was about two weeks. The week, uh, the last week, the glory week, and the week preceding. And that's what happens here. 
John 11 tells the story about a Lazarus, Lazarus dying. Jesus came face to face with death and knew that God wanted more. God wanted resurrection. But yet he was touched by it because the Bible says he was full of emotion and wept. Death did that to our Lord. They went to the place just outside of Jerusalem. And Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, came and had this great amount of lard, a uh, spignard, and, and, and took it and anointed Jesus' feet. We remember the, remember the story because Judas Iscariot was there and said, why was this waste? This could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Jesus said, let her alone. She has done a good work. She has done this for my burial. Once again, he is confronted by death. He goes into Jerusalem, the temple, Passover week. I wonder how many families he passed coming to the great celebration who were bringing a lamb that would be slaughtered for their sins of their family. All week long he was there. There, You know that he could hear the baying of the lambs in the background. The slaughter of the lambs would happen all week. It couldn't be done in a few hours. The priests were doing this every day. You could smell the burning of flesh everywhere they went. The stench of death was there. And now, there's a group of people who are coming and they want to see Jesus. A group of Greeks, and they find Philip because they know he's from Bethesda. Maybe he'll be uh, sympathetic to their cause and he doesn't really know what to do. Philip says, I don't know. Uh, let me go to Andrew because Andrew was bold. He just, just jumped through the door. So Andrew says, well, come on. They want to know Jesus. Let's go talk to Jesus. And Andrew and Philip went to him and, and said, Lord, they want to meet you. They want to talk with you. And then we hear Jesus' reply in verse number 23. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Matter of fact, all of you have read the Gospels probably many, many times. If you do read through them, you'll notice that there will be events that would come up. There will be situations and circumstances. And Jesus will give this reply. My hour has not yet come. They tried to kill him one time. But he said, no, my hour has not yet come. He wasn't worried about it then because he knew God had sent him for a mission and God would protect him and take care of him, provide for him as he was seeking to walk with God, do the will of God for the glory of God and for the benefit of us. But now it changes. The hour has come. The hour of his sacrifice. Look at his next words as he puts them together. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. I was going to bring a table up here and, and a whole bag full of seed and just pour them out here as an illustration. And I thought, I don't need to do that. They know that. If you take a bag of seed, you know what you've got? A bag of seed. If I poured them out here on a table, you know what you'd have? You'd have a bunch of individual seeds that would get into the carpet and our custodian would say, what in the world did they do in church this past week? But those seeds there, that's all you've got is the seed encapsulated in that. There's life there, but it's life that's not ever been regenerated. It's just encapsulated there. It remains alone. Nothing's going to change. The only thing that can change is if that seed is planted and it dies. And you don't understand this and I don't understand this, but God will take that seed after it dies and what is in it will come alive. It will regenerate. There will be, there will be something that is in all essence everything that was 
encapsulated in that seed, but it's turned loose and it grows, not just as a seed, but as a life-giving plant, not just to produce one seed, one grain, but many. And as I look out over this congregation, you know what I see? A lot of seeds that has been encapsulated and life is in there. But if there is no fruit, it's because the seed is still there living unto itself alone because it has not been planted, it has not died. All of us can talk about the state of Christianity today. We could debate the good part and the bad part. We could debate and say, this is, this is a great thing. This is, I don't understand why there's not more movement of the Spirit of God among His people. I don't understand why we're talking about victory. We just sang about victory in Jesus. But why is it that so many people are not living the, the victory? Why is it that we are overcome by our circumstances rather than being victorious? Revelation 12, 11, one of the verses that rocked me, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Come on. By the word of their testimony. And they loved not their life unto the death. We're good with the blood of Christ. Amen? And we understand the witness of that. The word of their testimony. We might not be too cheerful about, and they love not their life unto the dead. And yet, that's the essence of life. It's the crucial statement that Jesus made. It is a master principle. It is a major paradox. We don't fully understand it, yet we know it to be truth. Jesus is sharing truth. It's the secret to move from life to abundant life. It's the, it's the secret of moving from one to many. Fruitlessness to blessing of fruitfulness. It's the secret of moving from defeat to being an overcomer. All must go through the ways of death. We'll never live the life that God called us to live until we learn to die. And have the attitude that Jesus had here. Look what he says here. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. Unless. It could be different. You know, Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. It could have been different. Jesus could have taken every fallen angel and cast them into the, the bottomless pit and left them there throughout all of eternity. He could have said, I don't want to go to the cross. And he could have left us here in our sin upon this planet and mankind, you know mankind, would have just went off and killed its existence without the loving hand of God to be there for us. Because sin breeds sin. We could have been separated from God forever. There are many things that describe hell. Weeping. Gnashing of teeth. Fire is describing hell. Torment. But I think the thing that would be the worst would just eternally be alone. Choosing themselves. And that's all that they ever get. They remain alone. Better. I was in a meeting one time. And this guy said, I just can't wait to get to hell. It's going to be the greatest party ever. And I said, well, you're going to be the only one there. Oh, everybody's going to hell. I said, well, you're going to have your own hell. You're going to have your own hell. 
Could you imagine spending eternity without the very nature of God? No love, no joy, no peace. No belonging, no hope. Just alone. Just alone. Living forever. Miserable. Praise God for the un- nevertheless or the unless. Praise God that Jesus said there could be another way. We must learn to die so that we can live. We must embrace the attitude of choosing the path that God took. Philippians 2, another great scripture that I studied and literally memorized because it talks about how God did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but He made Himself of no reputation. He came in the form of a servant. He humbled Himself. The only one worthy of all of the glory. Everything should be pointed to Him and He freely laid it down. But He knew this. Please hear this. He knew that if He did not come and live to die and live again, that we'd never have time with Him. And He would remain alone. We wouldn't be with Him. His love for you carried with him. I I hope you're, this is where I know that it's so hard to to carry and grasp the, the attitude and the desire to live for God to the point of full surrender and death so that the blessings of God could come. He didn't do this to hurt us. He did this to bless us. We love to talk about heaven. We love to talk about all the glories of it. But I'm here to tell you that will be the fruit of our death and service to Him. So many people are so bound by by how they determine what is best on earth and they hold to that and grasp that and cherish that. And will not move from that. And because of that, they will remain alone. No benefit, no blessing, no fruit. Because selfishness has taken in. It's almost like the car would be backing through the parking lot and a little poor coat would be there. And you're like, man, it's going to be tough on him. But I'm not doing that. No. Where's his parents at? They should be handling that. Where's Christian? (laughs) Or there will be something else within us that would just inspire love. Not criticism. Not criticism. Not pain. Not, not, Not tearing down, but building up because death breeds life. Humility lifts up. What was it John the Baptist said? He must increase. What? I must decrease. And John the Baptist could not do anything to to turn loose the, the glory of heaven, but that's exactly what Jesus did in bringing honor to him. Look at this. This verse is so hard but yet it's so real. Verse 25, He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You've got to come to the place where you say, what, my life, that's not the most important thing. My definition of repentance, I write it down, I read it every day out of my book, says this, it is a hard attitude that says everything I know to be sin or in the future to know it is sin, I would be willing to give up for Christ. That definition, I read it every day. Every day, I want to to, to walk my day with an attitude of repentance from, from my thinking to his thinking. Anything that is the right thing, that's what I must chase after. You see, the only way that you can find abundant life is through the simplicity of death. We're the greatest nation in the world. 
And I'm not sure that we don't lead the entire world in arrogance. In self-sufficiency. And I know that word, that just rubs people wrong. It rubs me wrong. And can I just be bluntly honest with you? I spent one day this week until about 7.30 at night in my office. And, and, well, I'll just tell you, it was Friday night. We were supposed to have date night. I was dressed up. Mark said, hey, he's got a coat and on. I was dressed up to go spend. And I was in my office just absolutely beaten down by this. Beaten down by this because I said, how can I go and preach to others what I'm not living I'm not acting like I'm super saint. I know there is something within me that wants to hold to what I think and what I believe and not literally, freely give it up. But here he says, you've got to hate your life. This is not Brian's words. This is challenging for me. And yet, I know the, the precept and the principle is until we learn this and grasp this, we're never going to learn to live until we learn to die. But if we learn to die, we're going to find the secret to living. He says here, if anyone loves his life, he will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, let my father, he says, him my father will honor. And yet, here's the invitation. Are we going to live our life for him the way we're comfortable with? Or are we going to live our life for him the way that's uncomfortable for us, but for his glory? Preacher, what do you mean? Verse 27, Jesus' words, my soul is troubled. Can you hear Jesus? Tell him the truth. By the way, he knows what's going to happen. And he knows there's victory on the other side. How many of you know that if you die, there's victory on the other side? It's not about that. It's not about the mental understanding of it. It's about being troubled and yet pushing through. We don't want to hear no. What we want to hear is yes. In our prayers, you know what we want? We want God to come down and join our prayers and answer our prayers so we can be the beneficiary of all the blessing. I'm not, look, I'm just as much about that as you are, but all of us are that way. And we may say, oh, Lord Jesus, for your will and your will. But do we really mean that? Because that's when the rubber hits the road is are we willing to substitute what we think for what God desires? Are we willing to yield everything unto Christ? Are we willing to have an attitude where he is first, where his glory is the most important thing? My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? <laughs> but for this purpose, I came to this hour. And by the way, you were saved for more. You were saved for more. Say it with me. I was saved for more. Say it. I was saved for more. God has a plan for you. God wants to use you. God sees victory in you. Look, I did six funerals last month. I understand I've been uh, hit over the head with this. It's everywhere that I turn. I've been seeing death. But yet, I, I see it in two angles. I saw a 25-year-old overdose who had all the potential in the world, and he gave it away chasing something that was an empty Empty hole. And I also saw my 47-year-old niece who just exuded Christ, 
who lived to be an encourager and, and to yield her life for the blessings of others. That's exactly what she did every day. In her phone, they found she had the, the, the number of the, the waiter at the Mexican restaurant. And there was a, a, a text thread where they could read the text for the two people. And she just kept texting this, this waiter in this Mexican restaurant, encouraging him in his Christian walk. And I'm thinking, how many people do that? Or how many people just want the service and walk away? How many of us have the thoughts that will bring honor and glory unto God, but we just, just let the thoughts go in and in one ear and out the other, and we just never act upon it? You understand why my sermon's so hard? Romans 8 is one of my favorite chapters. I say this. And we know that all things work together for good. Verse 28. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We like that verse. But then it says, for whom He foreknew, He predestined. For whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. God pre-chose the plan for us that we are to be like Christ. I'm not too sure that the part of... We, we just think that there's going to be this glorious boom and, and we're going to just go to heaven and we're going to just be perfect and all this kind of stuff. Well, we'll be cleansed and we'll be there and we'll have a new body and we'll be... But I'm not too sure that we're not going to spend eternity learning the blessings of God. Learning what it means to, to love. Learning what it means to share. And, and when you get to Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good, that means going through the circumstances. Sometimes we expect God just to, to give us this holy grenade of love and the circumstances will be changed and everybody will be healed physically and everybody will be healed emotionally and everyone will love everyone and everyone will be witnessing to others and everyone will be giving to others and everyone will be putting everyone else first. We just think there's going to be this holy thunderbolt of love. But we know Romans 8, 28, and we know it's not just that he does that. We know we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. We have to go through the circumstances. Did y'all catch that? We have to walk in there and be with him there. And, and, and in the circumstances, choosing Christ, choosing to say yes or choosing to say no. Jesus is great week he said this is the way it's got to be well, I came for this hour then a voice came from heaven and said hey I understand your trouble I have glorified it and I'll do it again I want you to think back to the time that you were so dearly in love with Christ when nothing else mattered and you just had such a uh, a desire in your heart just to live for Him. Nothing else mattered. You would yield anything. You would do anything. You would go anywhere. You would, you, your life was just simply opened unto Him. But something happened along the way. Maybe we just, as the old preacher Duncan Campbell said, Maybe we just need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. The disciples, when Jesus said that he would have to die, you know, oh, we'll go with you. We'll die with you. And they had an opportunity. But when the soldiers came and took Jesus, you know what they did? One of the most encouraging words I've ever heard was one of them ran so fast he took it, his clothes got caught in the thicket and he just kept on going naked. First streaker in the Bible. He was determined he was going to get out of there. Amen? Does that not sound like us sometimes? We'll come and we'll say, Lord, I yield it all. 
until the circumstance comes and we're like, I'm out of here. And yet, the physician doesn't get a physical, the attorney doesn't get a will, and good people are very comfortable where they are. And I'm not too sure that we're actually willing to change because that change may mean that we have to give up something we're not willing to give up. That's a tough word to say because it's coming into my heart. Can I just say I'm willing to give up everything I won't even willing to give up? But am I willing to give up the things that I'm not willing to give up? 